let's talk, let's talk about some deep sea communities. First, we're going to go over some geography so that we're all using the same terms for this discussion and also for the rest of the semester, some, some oceanic geography. Then we're going to hit on a couple of key concepts that we'll see repeated over and over again when it comes to this realm of our planet. First is that we're really talking about three-dimensional space, and much too often you and I are used to two-dimensional space, or at least gravity pulling us, trying to make us a pancake. And that's, it's a very different world down there. And uh, some of the other important elements of that are the light that's associated with this part of the planet, and uh, the energy that's going to go in and feed these, um, these ecosystems. And we'll, talk, we'll touch on a, a couple examples of hydrothermal vents and bioluminescence. So let's start with that geography lesson. These are, this is an exaggerated cross-section, but just meant to, to drive home the points. You and I live on a continent, right? And we are dry land, the stuff that's emerged uh, from the water. And we're on this chunk of essentially floating rock that's floating on other rock. So we're here. As soon as we hit the water, we go into the, into the water or below the tide line or the so-called subtidal zone. So below the tide, subtidal. And once we get there, if we, if we do this right now, if we jump off the coast, we're going to see some rocks or some sand that's lying on some rocks. That is the continental shelf. Most of the management challenges you and I will talk about this semester deal with uh, the continental shelf or just landward um, of the continental shelf. That's an area where more or less it's the same thing that you and I have here. It's just that the sea is a little bit higher. But you know, valleys and cliffs and things of that nature. Once we get on, and then the, the, the width of the continental shelf is going to vary. It's going to depend on if we're on the east coast or west coast or whatever. But at some point, um, it's going to go cease from being this relatively just a continuation, say, of, our, of the Santa Monica's and things like that down into the water to something different, a really consistent downward sloping, uh, consistently sloping area. That's the so-called continental slope. That's the, where everything's tumbling down, basically down into the depths. At the very bottom, we have the abyssal plain, the bottom of the ocean. Right at the base where the continental slope intersects the abyssal plain, there's a buildup, just like you'd see at the bottom of a landslide or the bottom of an avalanche. There's just some of that stuff that's tumbled down has built up into a toe at the bottom of that. Uh, escarpment, and so we call that little area the continental rise. That's just the last little bit before we, it's a change in slope and it's all the stuff that's accumulated at the bottom. Then we're on the abyssal plain. And that's, that's most of the water area of our planet is over the abyssal plain. So these broad, more or less flat stretches of the bottom of the ocean. These areas are punctuated by some places that go very deep and other places that shoot straight up. Here we're talking geologic volcanic activity. Let's first take in our diagram here, we have an oceanic trench, most famous of which is the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest location uh, in the uh, world's ocean. Essentially, that's a giant rent, a giant tear a slice into the otherwise flat plain that is the bottom of the ocean. And these trenches can be uh, quite uh, deep or just a little bit deep. Um, generally, they're where we have tectonic activity, something like that, you know, two plates moving apart or something of that nature. If we continue off to the right, we see a volcanic island, something like Hawaii, where we had, um, in the case of Hawaii, we had a uh, vol some volcanic activity, throwing up all this lava, adding additional molten rock, which as soon as it comes into contact with the water becomes hardened, and then you know then the then the hot stuff goes on top of that part that just hardened, etc. So over time we're building up, and we build up, build up, build up, 
When it gets close to the surface, it can actually emerge into the terrestrial zone, into the, the atmosphere. Many of our tropical islands are of this origin. We tend to have life back before we started destroying the oceans and trying to acidify this planet into nothingness. We had, we had coral reefs that would come and form around these things. And then as the rock, as the volcanic rock erodes, breaks down, etc., the life rock, the calcium carbonate structures of those reef building corals essentially takes over and keeps up with sea level rise or sea level change. And we have a biogenic, many times we have a biogenic capping of that island. So what we see looks to be all coral derived, excuse me, what we see when we're on land and we look at these islands, it looks to be coral derived, coral created, but in reality, almost all the time, those are actually sitting on volcanic rock uh, escarpments or, or volcanic rock columns. Um, and then we have something like on the far right, we have just sort of this funky thing, which is, again, another uh, 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 geological feature. In this case, this is a, a ridge where we might have two plates coming together. And it's not an island, say, that's thrown up, but it's an entire uh, 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 mountain range, subtitle mountain range, if you will. Okay, so real quickly, again, we have the continental shelf where we mostly think about. That's where we go and surf. That's where we go and scuba dive. That's where we go and, 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 and usually fish, that kind of stuff. Then we have the continental slope. At the toe of it is the continental rise and the abyssal plain. And this abyssal plain is every so often punctuated by a giant rent or trench or a giant uh, mountain or uh, island. Cool? Um, so when you're looking at like bombings, like the, the ledge and stuff, um, what part kind of are you looking at? So Shannon's question is, so when we look at a coral, a coral reef island like the Cook Islands, um, that we took a class to two summers ago, we're essentially looking at this part. So in this cartoon, this is showing something that would be, let's say, Hawaii. The Cooks, uh, uh, most of those, uh, let's say, um, uh, Aitutaki is all, this part is all eroded down, and maybe it would be equivalent if, if I drew a line right about here, and then the coral did the rest of it. So that, that would be a, a coral cap. So those bombies are all corals. Cool. All right. So this is the uh, uh, you know gross cross section of the ocean. Um, and these areas define important provinces, important regions that um, oftentimes have different management concerns or scenarios associated, associated with them. Obviously, there's the continents. You and I are on the continent. Um, the continental shelf, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, these continental shelves, because the sea level rise has come up and has come down over the course of the history of our planet as glaciers have melted, as glaciers have formed, etc. And so um, a decent amount of the continental shelf, especially stuff next to us, has been exposed. And we maybe are more familiar with that than other folks uh, might be because we have the Channel Islands. And, we, and we've learned a lot about how the Channel Islands uh, used to be, for example, one giant island, right? <coughs> We're looking for a chair? Here. Uh, what was it? Uh, one giant island, right? So that notion of the continental shelf either once exposed or potentially once exposed is, again, just a continuation of our continents. But that raises an interesting management issues, such as with sea level rise, for example. We are driving subtital some of our human history, right? So some of our Chumash burial sites, some of our early fishing uh, uh, sites um, are, are becoming inundated, and uh, those cultural resources are if not being put at risk, are, are harder to access or, or understand or explore, for example. OK, that, I just gave you the gross geography. Now I want to give you some, lo, some additional terms for uh, different regions in the ocean. A couple terms to start with. We have, uh, or let me just orient you. OK, so we have the land on the left, um, uh, tidal referring to the tides, so supra-tidal. You can also just call it terrestrial, right? But that means ab supra above more than, like super, you know, Superman kind of thing, above uh, the tide lines. Then we hit the area between the tides, the so-called inter between intertidal, and then again, like we said before, the area that, that's always wet all the time is the subtidal. 
Boy Scouts or something. Um, so dry land, land that's sometimes dry, sometimes wet, intertidal. Area that's always wet, subtitle. Okay, now let's talk about the area. So you guys might notice you got, so our Google Drive, I maintain that, that's littoral pirate. And so, because pirate was already taken, bastards. So, uh, so my email is littoral pirate. So littoral meaning of or associated with the coast. Okay, so littoral meaning means coastal. So if you look at this diagram, we have this littoral system. So that, that's what we're talking about the stuff that's uh, up here next to the coast. We can talk about things being far from the coast or far from an island or far from a terrestrial location. That's stuff that's far from anywhere else, just in water, 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 as far as I can see, pelagic. That's what we refer to, refer to as pelagic. Stuff that's down at the bottom or, or associated with an edge or a surface, the bottom most typically, is benthic. So pelagic up in the water column, benthic down next e either of or associated with the bottom or an edge. Cool? So here we go. Up high in the water, pelagic. Down below, benthic. Okay. I use the term littoral, meaning uh, of or associated with the coast. You can also use neuritic for that. So there's, there's the neuritic systems next over here, and then the oceanic systems over here. Neuritic are influenced by, uh, directly influenced by rivers and things like that. Okay, so all these terms, I know there's a lot of things here. But uh, does that make sense? You guys with me? So we have pelagic in the water, benthic associated with an edge. Um, neuritic or littoral and oceanic or uh, surrounded by water. Cool? Okay. So this is a location based terminology system for where we're talking about. Okay. I'm going to contrast that with uh, place based names that we associate it with organisms. So those last terms can apply to anything. You can apply them to organisms as well. We typically use additional modifiers when we're talking about the critters we're um, perhaps wanting to manage with our fishery or something based on where they live. And I'm going to give you a couple different names. So the first is, uh, let's start with the easiest one, benthos. That's just like benthic, right? So of or associated with the bottom. A crab that's walking along the bottom of the ocean is a, is a benthic crab or, or, or is, a, is of the benthos. Cool? Then we have a term you guys have probably heard of, plankton. So that's things that are floating in the current. So the th three-dimensional world of the global ocean. But yeah? Um, no, no, no. It could be a benthic could be like an elephant-sized thing, or it could be a little tip of a pin. Yeah, so, so so far all the stuff we're talking about, no size associated with them. It's just wh where they make their living. Okay, on to plankton. So plankton are, now there, there's, there's the old definitions and then the reality. So the old definition people used to say, don't write this down. I'm just going to say it so you, so you know this. People used to think plankton couldn't move. Essentially all of plankton's movements were dictated by the current. Okay, we know that not to be the case now. Now what we say is um, the majority of their movement is driven by the current. So many, many critters, even these little single-celled plankton individuals, we now know can, by moving little flagella or doing different things, uh, behavioral things or physiological changes, they can actually make themselves more buoyant or less buoyant, and they can, they can move up or down. But by and large, the currents are going to dictate where they move. Organisms, so you can write this down now. So plankton are organisms that are, have their location primarily determined by surrounding currents. The two most common plankton you guys have heard of are phytoplankton, right, which is a, a, a plankton in individual or, or organism that 
is a primary producer. So phyto, like plant, primary producer. And then what's the other plankton you've heard of? Zooplankton, right. So that would be, um, again, somebody that's floating around the, in the water column, but, but is not a primary producer. So somebody that might be eating some of those primary producers, OK? So phytoplankton, zooplankton, those are just examples of overall plankton. The other thing I have in this group with plankton is this term nekton. Have you guys heard about that? Yeah, it's not, not as common a term. So nekton, same exact thing as plankton, but instead of, uh, but these guys now can control where they swim. They might, they might be influenced by the currents, but they can decide where they go. Tuna would be a nekton. A whale would be a nekton, right? So they, they might kind of you know, chill for a while and move with the current, or the current might, might make them, say, move faster than they otherwise could beat their fins. But if they want to go up, they can go up. Now, generally, it's not entirely true, but generally, um, the, if you're a single-celled critter, you're a plankton. That's pretty much always true. If you are big, you are nekton, generally. But we do have big, giant individuals, things like siphonophores and things, that might fill the entirety of the space of, C of Sierra Hall that have their movements dictated by the currents. But generally, as a quick, rough, you know, you know, rough estimate, Plankton tend to be small, nekton tend to be big, but that is, it's not a one, it's not a perfect, perfect description. Cool? The last name I have on here are for critters of or associated with the film, the surface film of the ocean, and that's nuston. So that would be, um, for example, some larval fish hang out near floating seaweed, uh, clumps, always right at the top of the ocean. They don't, they don't go deep at all. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so we have this, we have this geographic uh, articulation of where we are in the world's ocean, and then we can talk about um, modifiers we put onto critters for where they live or how they, they move about the ocean. Yeah, cool? All right. Let's talk a little bit about, for a second, about productivity in the ocean. We can talk about or critters that make their own energy from, uh, excuse me, make their own chemical energy from an external energy source, like the sun is the classic example. Those would be autotrophs or self, self eaters, if you will. And then heterotrophs or other eaters. So heterotrophs would be the Critters are going to feed on some other organism to get their uh, chemical bonds that they will then in turn use to power their life. Um, yeah, okay. So you guys know all this. This is, this is nothing new. We've already, we've already talked about this. So you guys have had this before. Um, but the key thing here is the main thing, the, the first thing we always talk about are are photonivores, light eaters, okay? So that's when we talk about autotrophs, you guys are thinking about green plants, you know, trees, things like that. So let's talk about that first. So productivity turns out to be a really key segregator of regions of the ocean. First thing to say about that is that productivity directly varies with depth. We talked about this last time, we talked about light and how light decays with depth, right? And and exponentially decays and all that kind of good stuff. So obviously, the high, if we're talking about uh, you know, individuals using light to generate their energy to, to fix their chemical bonds, um, the highest light is, again, at the very, very surface of the ocean. And we call that area where light penetrates into the ocean the photic zone. Phot photic, just like photon, photic zone. In the photic zone, there's ample sunlight, and there is sun-derived radiation that is in, in the water. We can, the photic zone can be broken up into two different uh, uh, types of photic zone. Uh, yeah, right. So there's the euphotic, or the true, U means true. So the true photic zone, 
And, that this, and now these depths will vary. It's going to depend if we're close to a river mouth with a bunch of sediment in the water. But as a, you know, just placeholder there, on the order of about 80 meters down is the euphotic zone. That's the area where a phytoplankton, a, a primary producer, a giant kelp, whatever it is, can meet and exceed its physiological needs with the amount of radiation that it is receiving into its photo, uh, photosystems, right? So in other words, there's enough energy there to supply uh, the needs of that primary producer. Below 80 meters, there might still be light around, but this is sometimes referred to as the dysphotic zone because it, it's still in the photic zone, but it's, it's generally not enough to meet your uh, physiological needs. So it might be fine if you're there for a short period of time. That might be cool. But uh, for a permanently attached individual, um, they, they cannot be surviving solely based on uh, light energy because there's not enough to meet their demands. Their, their, their bodily function, their physiology needs more energy than they can supply from the light alone. But it's not dark. It, well, it, it'll look dark, but it's not, it's not completely black. And then uh, we get, and so, so you, we can also refer to this critical depth where the production of energy versus your consumption of energy equals it, it itself as the critical depth. The critical depth will vary depending on what critter we're talking about, we, which species of phytoplankton, et cetera. Um, but, but that's what we're talking about. Um, and generally, uh, generally, that's going to happen when the light level is at or around 1% of the magnitude of energy that starts at the surface. Um, and then, so we have the, this photic zone, this light zone. And we talked about the photic zone being euphotic and aphotic, or excuse me, euphotic and dysphotic. And then we have this. So this is the aphotic zone. And again, while this varies, pretty much anywhere in the world, once you hit 200 meters, it's going to look like this. So the, the, the aphotic zone is, is uh, it, might, it might start earlier than this, but by the time you hit 200 meters, you're always going to be in the complete dark. That, that was much more dramatic when we were in a dark room, but sorry. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> There's patterns to this productivity. There's patterns to this productivity as we look across the ocean. This is a satellite image that's using a very special uh, spectrophotometer that's looking for um, essentially chlorophyll A. The most, while there are many photosystems on the planet, chlorophyll A is the most common. And so this is a, a quick shorthand that most biological oceanographers use for ocean surface water ocean productivity. So we're looking at here is we're looking down. And what, what, you guys see any patterns here? With, with hotter being more chlorophyll A, colder being less chlorophyll A per pixel of the satellite sensor. So you guys see any patterns in this? OK, more at the top and the bottom. It, this, that could be the, the time of year. But OK, good, but good, right? Yeah, so it's, it's more, more redder, more, more yellowy, more hot colors towards the top when this image was taken. Cool. Yeah, coastal areas. areas. Yeah, totally. Check it out. So m maybe it's the top, maybe it's the bottom, but pretty much always when we're next to a dark spot, which again is the land, um, check it out, right? And, and so that's good. So coastal areas, anything else? Any modifiers in the coastal areas? Pick like say Africa. Is, is it the same on the west coast of Africa? Right, west is higher than east. But also, if we just if we just say stay on the west coast, is it the same up and down the coast? Why? Why is it not the same? Uh, yeah, knowing nothing else, maybe you could think it could be depth, possibly. Current temperature. Cur yeah, right. Currents. Well, so yeah, so we talked about last time about this notion. I mean, there's many explanations here, but but one of which is upwelling, right? So based on how the winds and the tides and the current things are moving water around, we get these, this phenomenon oftentimes where um, when we have a landmass, we have movement, over, wind blowing off the top of that, um, the wind blowing off the top of that um, 
landmass, and it is blowing that surface water away. Generally, surface water is warmer, and warmer water, what? More, more nutrients, less nutrients? Less nutrients. More oxygen, less oxygen? Less on average. The, 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 the deep, cold water masses tend to be nutrient rich, tend to be oxygen rich, and they tend to really be really primed to feed primary productivity. So what we're seeing along, for example, some of these western margins of these continents are essentially the consequences of those things we learned last time, right? The sort of physics of the spinning earth and, and uh, all this and that. So, so productivity is varying, right? Productivity is varying, but, but we do have areas that are higher and lower, and, uh, and some of those will be higher during some times of the year, not others. So I can tell you, for example, this, this uh, image here was taking dur taken during either the spring or fall in the northern hemisphere because what we're seeing there is, is like, say, along Russia and in Alaska and everything, we're, we're seeing all this glacial melt, all this water melt is going in, and we're seeing also uh, uh, sea ice melting that's fueling some of this productivity. You see the same phenomenon down in Antarctica. So, um, so we, there is seasonality, but there's also this... Uh, long-term consistency. So productivity varies, right? So you guys got it. Coastal and upwelling zones, you guys are smart. Awesome. Um, again, same pattern. We see this See this around. This, this is a, a more averaged across the years, but the same, same basic phenomenon. As you guys just mentioned, in the coastal zone, most productive. Out in the middle of the ocean, out, out by Hawaii, generally speaking, on a per unit basis, air, uh, per unit basis on the surface of the ocean, not so much happening. That's why you can go to Hawaii and see these really beautiful coral reefs really far. And that's why we're diving off of uh, where we were at Santa Cruz this weekend. Um, you know, I take a lot of people out diving that have never been diving, and some people are like, yeah, it's awesome. And other people, and so we went, we were, um, I was taking a group out to go look at some kelp beds, and these, uh, these other folks said, hey, I want to come diving with you. I said, okay, cool, come on. And then all my scouts were saying, oh, we're tired. We want to sit on the beach after you know, hours and hours of kayaking and everything. So I said, okay. And so I only had these adults with me. And I said, great. You guys want to go see the like, lobsters and stuff? Yeah, okay, let's go to the caves. So I started kicking over the caves. It's from Scorpion Cove, which isn't super far. Um, and we're going, and, and the water was kind of cloudy. Right? Because we had these southern swells, so it was kicking it up. So our, pro our coastal productivity was getting in the way of seeing clearly, right? And so we're going, and then I like swam into this kelp bed and look back, and these, these two folks are way behind, right? And I was like, oh, are you guys okay? I'm like, yeah. I said, okay. So I'm like flop, 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 looking at fish and everything. Wait, when are these guys coming? When are these guys coming? And they're still really far away. So I finally swim over to them like, hey, so... Do you guys want to cut? Like, is it okay to go in the kelp? And I said, sure, it's okay to come on the kelp. Come on in the kelp. I said, well, but isn't it kind of hard to swim through it? It's like, well, yeah, kind of, but it's fine. And, you know, just come on in. And they said, yeah, but, you know. So then I started realizing something was amiss. And so I said, so, uh, what? Said, well, we want to see some fish. I said, fish? Come in the kelp bed. There's like a gazillion fish. There's like a big kelp out there. And there's like a rah, 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 rah. They're like, oh, yeah, but we can't see stuff as well. We can see stuff better over the, where we came from. And I said, what? There's way more stuff here. Turns out those guys were not comfortable uh, free divers, so they were just floating at the surface. So I assumed they were divers because they asked me to come take them out somewhere. So I was going down, and when you, when you dive down 10, 20 feet, then you can see the stuff because you're really close. But those guys were floating at the surface and staying at the surface, and the bottom of the ocean was maybe 30 feet, 40 feet down. And because of the water clarity, they couldn't see very much. And they're like, this is boring as hell. Right? So they were having more fun right in, in the rocks by the beach because um, you know, the, the fish were only a, a foot or a couple feet from their face. Much smaller fish, much more boring fish, you might say. But, um, but still, right? so, so that's, a, that's an example of this, what we're looking at right here. This varying productivity, this varying water clarity, depending on where we are. If, we, if I was with those guys in Hawaii and we did the same thing, I mean, assuming there wasn't a typhoon or something coming through, but if we went out, they would have been fine if we swam somewhere and it was 30 feet down. They could still see tons of stuff because the water clarity would generally be a lot uh, better on average. Cool? Yeah, I was, I was looking at your map and uh, I saw a picture of one of the side at the bottom. It's a very high water clarity and it's right at the base of Tasmania Mass. 
There you go. There you go. Go get some fish in Sri Lanka. Excellent. Now, all the stuff we've talked up to this point has been solar-based uh, life systems, solar-based food webs. But as you guys know, there's these other things called hydrothermal, well, there, there's a group of things, but we'll just lump them into this notion of hydrothermal vents. Hydro, water, thermal heat, so these hot water places in the earth. And, and we will show, when we break, I'll show you some video of some, some of the first discovery of these. But um, long story short, the idea is this is primary productivity from a different energy source than the sun. So these things were first discovered in the 1970s. Before they were discovered, people thought this wasn't possible, that all life systems had to be derived from energy from photosynthetic organisms. This was the discovery that we had so-called chemosynthetic systems that could be wide-ranging and down at the bottom of the ocean. And so these guys are, are are uh, made possible by these so-called extremophiles, which are critters that can live in ex under extreme environmental conditions that otherwise we might think most quote unquote common life forms could not survive because of the, the physical conditions uh, to which they are exposed. Primarily what we're talking about here is the ability to take hydrogen sulfide and break that chemical um, compound, that molecule, apart and get energy from those chemical bonds. So rather than getting energy from a photon that's going to smack an electron and, and, and do some stuff that you guys learned about in your intro bio class in that photosynthetic pathway, instead of using the, the energy from the light, we're going to use energy from another chemical bond. That chemical bond is created by the pressures and the chemistry of the volcanic activity down in the bowels of the earth. And that's it. We have hydrothermal vents in various places. So we, we first discovered them, and then once people knew about them and started looking for them, we started finding them in, all over the planet. So associated with these vents are these, as I mentioned before, these chemosynthetic bacteria. These individuals can be free living just out in the water, uh, you know, the, the, the bubbling water itself, or they can be associated with an organism. And, uh, yeah, I'll say that. So incredible diversity uh, can be found down at these areas. And so, when, when, again, when I show you the video of these guys that first discovered this, they were geologists, right? They were, they were looking for rocks. They were looking at how this lava was coming out and all this and that. And all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, what? Like, that's not supposed to be here. So they better go grab some biologists and bring them back and see what's going on. Uh, all kinds of crazy cool stuff. These guys here with these, with these uh, on the lower left here, that looks like these red kind of burrito-like things or red taco-like things. Um, those are vestiminiferum worms. We have uh, crabs, we have clams, we have all kinds of critters um, associated with these, um, these hydrothermal vents. Again, some of these things are, are uh, free living. Others are associated with an organism intimately. So they're inside the tissues. So for example, for these vestiminiferum worms, these red things here, these are these these are their uh, uh, exchange medium. These, these are the ways they're absorbing uh, stuff from the water, uh, absorbing things from the water, and then releasing waste into the water. Uh, uh, so what, so the, yeah, I would say that. So they're going to, they have, just like coral, photos, so, so reef-building coral have zooxanthellae that are, essentially phytoplankton that have been captured inside. And these little phytoplankton are kind of prisoners. Well, there's a whole long philosophical debate. Are they prisoners? Are they, you know, commensal, amensal? How is the relationship? But, but the point is they have these phytoplankton inside of them. These phytoplankton fix that solar energy and then leak these sugars. 
that then the coral uses for energy. Same thing here. Instead of photosynthetic microbial structures, we're talking about chemosynthetic structures of the organisms that have been captured. So they, these guys have in their gills, they have these, um, these individuals that can absorb this toxic water, take that hydrogen sulfide or similar compounds, break it apart, and, and go uh, generate sugars from that. When we talk about these deep systems, be they hydrothermal vents or be they just, you know, any old, any old place, uh, the first most important thing we have to remember is the, the very, very high pressures. We talked about that last time. Very, very high pressures, right? Recall that for every 10 meters into the ocean, this is we get, for every depth, additional 10 meters of depth, we're adding an additional atmosphere worth of pressure, right? So if we have a balloon that we talked about, the cartoon, a balloon at this, uh, whatever uh, one foot diameter at the surface, if we take it down 10 meters and, and you have tied it off and are not letting any air go in or out, it's going to be half a foot wide or half a foot in diameter, right? That's the first thing. The other thing is, that, as we talked about before, the default conditions in the bottom of the ocean, cold, right? Just a little bit above freezing. Um, no sunlight, no photosynthesis, already said that. The general thought, there's also some debate about this, but the general thought is, on, av on at least on a per unit area basis, food tends to be scarce, at least relative to the coastal zones and, and tropical forests and things like that, right? So if you're, if you're looking for food, not a whole lot of stuff necessarily, you know, there aren't fields and fields and fields of daisies necessarily. <coughs> the other important thing to think about is that this is really three-dimensional space, right? And so with this three-dimensional space, if food resources are relatively scarce, that means the, the chance of you encountering your prey is relatively low, but also your chances of encountering a mate are possibly relatively low. So that's probably, without, with knowing nothing else, it's a good chance, as you might suspect, some of the behaviors might have to be different. Some of the life history might, ask, might have to be different than the types of life histories we're ex experiencing here on land or here near the coast. How you find food, how you make babies. The things that live down deep, um, again, this is, this is the largest uh, area that we're talking about on the earth, the most amount of bottom of the ocean, most amount of, of liquid water. Many of the building blocks are going to be imported from the photic zone, from, from the, the top of the ocean, and things are going to drift down. They're going to drift down in the form of poop. They're going to drift down in the form of dead critters. They're going to drift down in the form of, of various things. It used to be the case that folks thought things were always boring down at the bottom and things were always very constant. You'll hear that this comes up again when we talk about management of these systems. The thought was that, oh man, these are very stable systems. Not a lot of up, not a lot of down, pretty just straight. We now recognize that there are indeed seasonal pulses of material down there. One might, one might some seasonal pulses of stuff from the shallows be going down to the deep. I was thinking uh, the thing that would divide off every, every species. Sure, sure. So if you have a, a, an algal bloom, let's say, we have some, some conditions. It could be too much nutrients or it could be something about the wind or whatever. But we have a bunch of, of phytoplankton, let's say, growing, 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 and then die over a short period of time. So that could happen. And again, we talked about, right, we talked about this upwelling phenomenon where we you know, pretty consistently with knowing the season and everything, we know this is going to be happening. So we can have, uh, in, uh, we can have uh, pulses from that. What are other pulses we could get? Uh, yeah, we could just have large, well, we used to have very large, but, but you know, biological so aggregations of critters. And so something like that, like, like a big salmonid run, possibly, good. What else? 
Uh, big swell, possibly big swell. Although, uh, I'm not, yeah, so how would, how would the big swell drive it down? I'm not, I'm not sure about that part. Maybe just like churning, churning up the water a lot more. Could, yeah. could, could. May, uh, especially um, if we had a big, if we had a big, uh, you know, uh, monsoon condition or a big rain dump and all of a sudden all the stuff in the rivers is being flushed out and you can, and if it's a real strong pulse, it can go fairly far offshore, possibly off the continental shelf. And then, you know, and that, that could bring sediment and other materials also pulsing down in. Any other thoughts? Could be, could be, but like the, like the swell, yeah, they could do it, but, but, Yeah, uh, maybe, but I'm not sure how that will go. There's another one that we'll talk about um, uh, next, but uh, I'll, I'll hold off on that, that next big one. Um, okay, so seasonal pulse of organic matter. Um, right, so the overall, um, on, on, on a per unit basis, relatively on average low biomass, but m higher biodiversity than we've, we would otherwise expect. Now, this is not an, an ecology class, so we don't go into the theory of biodiversity, but, but I'll just suffice it to say lots and lots of ecologists and evolutionary biologists spend their whole careers theorizing uh, why we have certain levels of biodiversity and others, and I'll just say it's complex. <laughs> I'll just say that because that's not what this class is about. But, but uh, high, relatively high biodiversity for what we would otherwise expect on the bottom of the ocean. Um, very, very common life history characteristic is eating dead stuff, so-called detri detritivores, detritus, the things that were, were once living and are now just floating around in you know, dead tissue or dying tissue. And, and this, this goes across many different groups of uh, many different taxa are detritivores. Uh, before we look at those videos and, and all that good stuff, the question was, um, so low biomass, high diversity of, spe fi of fish species, why? And what were some of our ideas? Specialization, somebody said. Anybody else have any other ideas? Okay, okay. So this, the, the, this, this encounter probability might have something to do with it. Cool. Anybody else have any other ideas? So the answer is I don't know. If I knew I'd be famous. But uh, it probably seems to be like what you guys are saying. Probably has something to do with this really high concentration of um, scavenging um, and this sort of looking for prey and looking for sustenance that seems to possibly have been have driven this uh, large diversity in ways to go about finding food. So <clears throat> We, we started with these, with these general aspects of the, of the deep ocean, right? We already talked about this. We already listed these. But realize when we're near these hydrothermal vent areas, we have some countervailing forces, some things that are acting to counter those, <clears throat> those aspects or those components of the ecosystem. So we have, again, the, the chemosynthetic energy system as opposed to the photosynthetic food web. It's not necessarily cold by the hydrothermal vents, at least in close proximity. It's, it's hot lava water coming out of the bottom of the earth, so it's warm, right? In fact, it can be boiling. And as, as evidenced by these minerals, uh, by, as evidenced by the, the deposition around the edge, there's lots of minerals in this water, different um, constituencies, and that can uh, provide different um, potential sources of building material, et cetera. So now, you know, the, the default generic bottom of the ocean is more or less fairly homogeneous, we think. I mean, there is structure there, but generally homogeneous. But then we hit one of these things, these places, very different. This is definitely not like the surrounding local areas. So that's some positive, but also has downsides, right? It's gonna, tr it's gonna concentrate uh, organisms, and that's great. If you're looking for a mate, but your predators might come to you as well. So with everything, there's pluses and minuses, benefits and costs, but location is, is clearly much more important and much more significant here at the in the hydrothermal vent systems. 
You don't need to jot all this down, obviously, but just to give you a visual notion of what's going on here with these uh, hot vents, these hydrothermal vents, we basically are seeing water dribble in, leach in, leak into the subsurface strata from surrounding ocean. That stuff gets in. It gets next to a heat source, a, a magma chamber, something of that nature boils, the heat combined with the substances in the seawater combined with the substances in the rock lead to this chemical fusion, chemical gumbo, if you will. And then that stuff gets hot and that hot stuff now starts going to cracks and finds its way out. So we're not talking about outright lava coming out of these things. We're talking about instead water that has come into contact with essentially lava at some point down below the surface. And these are, you could think of it, the pressure valve. These hydrothermal vents are the, the venting of this hot, warm, now slightly less dense material, right, because we know it's hotter. And so that's what's coming out at these, um, at these areas. Once we see a new hydrothermal vent em emerge, we see a succession develop. First, let's, let's say we have two plates separating, or a crack forms. Okay, boom, hot water starts coming out. First, the colonizers come in that are the single-celled bacteria. They come in, boom. Next, we have the things that come in that feed upon those guys. So something like amphipods, copepods, these small crustaceans, invertebrates, relatives of crabs and lobsters. Next, we have the uh, grazing and filter feeding community come in. These would be things like snails, like limpets, clams, etc. And then once that community is starting to get, get abundant, then we have the scavengers that start to come in. Um, scavengers that eat all these different uh, food items. Then we get uh, predators that come in that will eat those things and, all, and also some of the scavengers that have come in. And alongside this, again, we have this sort of uh, core group of individuals that have entered into this evolutionary partnership with these chemosynthetic bacteria. And the most obvious ones are the vestiminiferum worms, those things with the really red mantles that we saw, and then the, um, these clams, uh, Tevnia and Riftia. Any given s vent spot, seems to persist. I mean, there's variance, but on the order of a year to a decade or so. Again, we saw these images. Here. These are crabs that are feeding off of the algal mats right on the edge of this rift. So, that, so they're eating off these, um, these microbial films. We also have, uh, just for completeness, we also have so-called cold seeps, which are essentially the same thing. It's just not as hot um, coming out of the bottom of the water. But it's still mineral rich, and it still can provide the foundation for chemical synthetic uh, food webs. And uh, above than that, very similar to the hydrothermal vents. And so this is what a, one cold seep can look like, right? So. Uh, not all that hot water boiling out. Also want to touch on bioluminescence. We already mentioned that. We already saw some of those videos. This is, there are, are various pathways to this, but the most common one would be luciferin luciferase. So luciferin is the protein. Luciferase is the enzyme. You take those, so you, you merge these two together in the presence of oxygen and we uh, produce this oxygenated form of the protein and a byproduct. That byproduct is a photon. That byproduct is light. Um, and that's how we get bioluminescence, which is, how common is that as, as, form, as a form of communication on the planet? It's the most common. Thank you very much. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys some pictures now that illustrate some of these body forms and some of these different things we've been talking about. These are great photos, so I, I keep using them. 
Initially, these were passed around as this internet hoax. So they were passed around as saying, oh my God, after the Indonesian tsunami, all this stuff washed up. It's crazy, crazy sea creatures. No, it's not true. Didn't happen. These were from a New Zealand, these are collected from a scientific expedition in New Zealand and guys going after deep sea critters. So these are all real pictures and real organisms, but they didn't, they weren't flopping on the streets in Indonesia after the tsunami. Here's, uh, here are two fish. You guys see the two fish? The big one is a female. The little one is a male. In this case, one of the responses to the low encounter probability, we've been talking about, mate, uh, been talking about uh, food, in this case it's mate. What, what the, the solution here is when the male finds a female, he latches on, bites on, and then essentially uh, cu cuts into her blood flow and then starts to get his sustenance from that, and then he basically dies. So he, is, he, he stops feeding and everything, and he becomes essentially a, sp a portable sperm sack for her. So his whole life is over, and, she, and the female is going around doing her deal. Now she doesn't have to worry about finding another mate, because whenever she needs to reproduce, she's got the dude right there, right? No, no harm, no fuss, don't have to worry about the toilet seat, none of that stuff, right? <laughs> So that's one extreme example of this low encounter probability thing, right? If these guys, if there was males and females, but, well, I don't know, maybe they would evolve that way, but you know, probably not, right? Probably you wouldn't need to do that extreme case of, of sexual selection if, you, if there were ample mates around. Cool. So um, the top one is this basket work eel. Look at this. So we'll see this a lot with these critters. Very elongated, right? Snake-like, serpentine-like, right? So the fish are like this. The cephalopods are like this. Two common colors that we see down there. One is the one on top, which is um, dark black. And the other is on the bottom. Now, this guy's been, this, the squid's kind of been hammered by the net or whatever they use to bring them in. But um, there's some pale tissue there. But there's also, what's the other color? Red. Red. Here's, here's uh, some of the, that, those bioluminescent structures. In this case, this dragonfish is using that, um, this guy here as a lure, right? So it can be articulated. It can, it can flick. It can make it look like, I don't know, a, a, a shrimp or or whatever is supposedly looking tasty to whoever, come on in and then uh, you know, suck it in. You can also see a bioluminescent structure right below, beneath his eyes. Right? So there's a circular eye and then below it. You'll see a lot of this with these fish uh, or, or organisms that have these bioluminescent organisms, uh, organs, Jesus, bioluminescent, these, these organisms with bioluminescent organs uh, proximate to their their head or their eyes. So sometimes that appears to be like a flashlight. In other cases, it might be a lure to bring guys, to bring uh, prey in. Um, yeah, nice teeth on this guy too. So here's a lobster that, um, again, what's the color? Red. Red, the other name for red, optically black in the ocean, right? So because that red light's gone, If we shine a green light on this, this other guy doesn't look green. If we shine a white light on this, he looks red, right? So if we take that red out, functionally, under most light down there, this is black. This only looks red because we brought him up to the surface and have our white flash on. You guys with me? So red is just like black. Also, just kind of by the by, in fact, it might be one of the reasons why, why carotenoid pigments are the color they are, but a lot of a lot of crustaceans produce this orange red pigment. So right, this is probably not unrelated. So shrimp, boil lobster, the, the shell is really red. That that same phenomenon. Cool. So is this guy? 
Now, does this look like a typical lobster you guys have seen? Looks kind of flat. What else looks maybe different? Right. So much more kind of fine scale. Yup, 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 let me look for some food, right? As opposed to, say, the classic would be the main lobster, right, with a big honking giant, you know, nutcracker of a, of a claw. Because that guy's primarily using that claw to crack open mussel shells and, and things of that nature, right? Uh, crack open that, that walnut. Uh, it's hard. It needs a lot of energy, right? This guy's not expending a lot of energy. This guy's more of a delicate, let me go find this dead thing. Let me go pick through this worm field, right? So different life history. How about the blobfish? Again, these guys have been, been through a net, so he looks a little uh, worse for the wear. But, like, what is that dude doing, right? Other body shapes. Here's a, here's a, a seashell, right, calcium carbonate that floats. So this isn't on the benthos. This is up in the, in the midwater. But, but um, this guy has essentially created a bunch of little um, uh, float balls, if you will to counteract the density of the weight of the shell, right? So little floats, little buoyant floats around to make this guy able to float around, even though his, his, his structure would otherwise make him sink to the bottom rapidly. Here's a chimera. Now, this is a, a picture on deck. And so somebody took a camera, took a photograph, boom. What did this guy's eye look like? Any of you guys have cats, dogs? You guys take a picture of them? Does your cat eye ever look like that? Look, okay, it goes red. Right, but the whole th the whole back of it is that color, right? So, cats. When do cats like to eat? You guys know? In the wild, yeah. So the cats are optimized crepuscular feeders. So felines, so carnivores in general, but especially felines, are really good crepuscular feeders. They're really good in low light situations. This guy, down at the bottom of the ocean, good low light situations. The reason your cat's eye looks like that big thing is because they have tons of, of sensors, tons of cells in the back of their eye to capture light because they're, they're sensitive. Because they one of the ways they get sensitive is they have many more sensors, right? So you catch a little flicker of light. Same thing here. We're seeing the same phenomenon of this chimera. Here's a baby version of that same genus. Why does he have that shovel nose thing? Pfft, I have no idea. But it has, it must have some use, right? It must have some uh, helpful assist in the life history of this guy. Maybe he forages in the in the sediments or something uh, when they're when they're young. Uh, now check out again the red themes coming up again. Uh, big eyes. Look at this guy's mouth, kind of like the blobfish as well. It's a relatively large mouth, right? You guys with me on that? So this is the type of uh, and eyes are oriented up. So this is not a hunter. This isn't a hunter. It's going to be oh I'm tracking Lauren right. Going to go right to Lauren right. I'm going to sit here and wait for the prey to come to me. And I'm presumably, probably, benthic associated, right, with the benthos. Eyes are pointed up. Big mouth on the, on the essentially upper part of his body. So this is one of these guys that's maybe a so-called sit and wait predator. So I'm gonna wait for something big to come by. My eyes are primed, I'm watching for something to disturb the, the copepods and make flashing light or whatever. And then when they come, I'm going to, boom, open my big gaping mouth and, and suck whatever it is in. Um, here's a, a spider crab. Again, we see that red. Uh, here's a fang tooth. So some of these fish, their teeth are so big, they actually can't close, can't ever close their mouth. So again, look at those teeth. That's for biting on something? Is he, is he crunching, crunching, crunching? No. He's like, bite and hold on, right? Needle, needle-like teeth. <clears throat> this is a firefly squid. This is a squid incredibly, lots and lots of 
amazing bioluminescence on, on so many cool cephalopods. I always wish I did my PhD on cephalopods, but I, I didn't. So I'm, I'm sort of, I have a cephalopod thing. But, um, but this guy, all kinds of crazy cool photon of, so, so, so light emitting cells. Cephalopods in general, if we look close here, we can see all these uh, chromatophores. So not only do we have photon, uh, photophores, things that cells that create light under nervous control. So for this, this squid can decide when he wants a flash. Also has all this coloration, so it can match, it can, can change color. So uh, um, for example, um, octopus can actually change the shape of their skin too. So they can look more like a bumpy red rock, or they could flash with color. They can match backgrounds. They're incredibly, uh, they're amazing critters. And these guys' case, very, very huge, they, they swim in schools, very bioluminescent. A lot of the ocean cephalopods function in the role of oftentimes what we typically think of as fish close to the mainland. So these squids are, squid are active hunting predators really, really um, important in the open ocean. Here's a gunnard. Again, big eyes, big eyes, pink. Here's that hatchet fish you guys, or, or a relative of the hatchet fish you saw in the video. Again, this guy is compressed side to side and um, has that shimmeringness. And then the photonophores on the bottom of his belly to do the counter shading, to break up his silhouette if a, if a predator is looking from below up, uh, up towards the moon or the sun. Uh, lizard fish, lots of teeth. Again, grab on, hold on, bite, boom. Uh, a dory, big eye, capturing lots of light. Here's a prickly shark. I have no idea why that guy's dorsal fin is like that, but it is, so it must serve some purpose. Um, this is a pycnogonid uh, type of crustacean. People call them sea spiders. And uh, normally they're, they're quite small, the stuff we have here. They're quite small, little microscopic or like uh, you know, the size of a, a flea or a fly, typically. These guys we see in the polar areas. I have some of my office from Antarctica that I collected that are, that are big, but, but these, these guys are, are quite large. So this guy is you know, about two hand spans or something, much larger than our typical shallow water pycnogonids. Um, shovel nose lobster, this is a guy that's spending a lot of time digging into that sediment, right? So hey, maybe there's worms in that sediment, so this guy's gonna be going after those guys in the shallow, uh, shallow substrate. Stargazer, again, that notion of big eyes oriented upward, big mouth, you know, sit and wait predator, gump, I'm gonna whoosh, open my mouth really quick, suck stuff in and, and eat it. Uh, some more crabs, again, we see the red. Here's a crab that has a mod modified, um, the, 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 his hind two uh, appendages are modified to be able to swim. So this guy can walk on the, on the bottom, but he can also swim like kind of like a helicopter cruising around um, to go from spot to spot. Uh, tongue sole. Um, so here's a gulp reel. So here's one of those eels you guys saw in the video. Look at that mouth. So that mouth can essentially swing down and can eat a critter the size of itself or, or very close to the size of itself. That's crazy. That's totally crazy, right? Uh, I'm not sure about the ecology of this guy, but you know, you want to kill the thing first, right? You don't want a live critter inside of you. So I'm not sure how that guy handles that, but um, again, example of the low, presumably example of the low encounter probabilities that critters encounter down there. Viperfish, again, another one that can never close his mouth because these teeth are just too massive. Um, okay, so there you go. That's a little bit about the kind of critters we see down in the deep and open ocean. Think about some of these other lifestyles. Again, all of this stuff from so much of this science fiction, aliens, all this stuff comes from just looking at this stuff, looking at these, these crazy body shapes, crazy body forms, siphonophores, uh, uh, weird crustaceans, um, 
This is all real, right? This isn't made up. All kinds of amazing new stuff to discover down there. Um, meanwhile, certain folks on our planet would like us to just start harvesting the bottom regardless of whatever. So they'll tell you that, oh, the stuff down there, is, it's just the bottom of the sea. It's mud. Who cares, right? It's not just mud. There are biological resources down there. There are organisms down there. And this area is, is an, an increasingly important one that we need to figure out and manage, even though we know very little. So as a quick recap of today, we, I gave you guys those examples of the, the depth and location-based geography and then, and then uh, description of critters. These three key concepts we've gone back to several times, this notion of three-dimensionality, this notion of light, right? Uh, a lot of these crit critters down there have this structure, these blob fish, these weird shapes, because they're not constrained by gravity. They're three-dimensional space. They're oftentimes never encountering an edge, so they don't have to worry about that. We saw that tripod fish with the three legs, or the fins modified into essentially walking appendages. That would never work on land. That three-dimensionality is important. Light, one, we're oftentimes in the, in the aphotic zone, the non-sunlight zone, but that does not mean there's absolutely no light. The light that's there is biologically generated light. Bioluminescence is the what? Most common form of communication on the planet. Thank you. Excellent. Um, uh, typically, that bioluminescence is blue-green, but we saw a couple examples of other colors. Uh, and then energy, the source of energy. right? So if we're talking about traditional energy pathways, we're talking about material sinking down from the, the shallower waters, coming from the, the light-derived food webs. We do have these funky things, these cold seeps, these hydrothermal vents that actually um, provide an alternative, an alternative source of energy, an alternative food web. More about those uh, next. And then, uh, yeah, right, okay, I'll say that. So just to review, we have this uh, depth, or, or this geographic breakdown. We have the continental, uh, once we go subtitle, we have the continental shelf, we have the continental slope, the continental rise, the abyssal plain, and that abyssal plain is punctuated every so often by a giant trench or by a volcanic island, and then we do have these submarine ridges, and then again we have these different regions of the ocean, the oceanic and neuritic, the pelagic and benthic, and we talked about the different critters. What are the critters that live right close to the surface called? Newstun, right. What are, the, what are the organisms that spend their time in the, in the water column? that uh, primarily move with the currents? Plankton. Plankton. What are the guys that, that live there but can actually decide where they want to go? Necton. Necton. Okay, great. What's, a, what's an example of a, of a plankton individual? A single cell phytoplankton. Okay, good. What's an example of a necton? A whale. Okay, good. And then what are the guys that live down as, of or associated with the bottom? Benthos or benthic, right, good. All right, cool, awesome possum, good? All right. I think